chapter 3, verse 8. 1 Peter 3, 8. The apostle writes, he says, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the kindness that you have given us through bequeathing to us a day just for worship and for rest. Uh, Father, you know how busy your people are. Uh, We struggle to make ends meet. Even in our rest, we are worrisome. Uh, We are tired. Our vehicles have traveled many miles this week. Our minds have traveled even more. And Lord, everyone who has come here today has a different set of struggles and different problems that they're dealing with. Some are life and death, but some just keep us up at night, general worry and anxiety. We have health problems and financial problems and relationship problems. And Lord, we have all these problems because we acknowledge that we live in a fallen world. But Father, in your kindness, you've given us a day to come together to remind us that we're not alone and to remind us that you are with us every step of the way. And we thank you for Jesus' promise in which he says, Lo, and I am with you always, even until the end of the age. So I pray that you use the preaching of your word in a supernatural way to do something different for everybody here, that whatever our needs are, you would meet those varying needs using just this one verse. And we believe that your spirit is capable of that, and We know that the scripture is sharp as any two-edged sword, able to divide asunder soul and spirit, joint and marrow. And Lord, I pray that you would use it in a way that would edify everyone here. I also pray that the preaching would be glorifying to you, that you'd be pleased by it. And Father, we confess to you as a church that we stand proudly upon a belief in the scripture's inerrancy, that it is true from cover to cover. And we believe in the scripture's inspiration, that it might have been penned by men, but it was written and inspired by you. And we believe in the scripture's sufficiency, that it is enough for us. And we believe in the scripture's authority, that it ought to be binding over the heart and conscience of the believer. And we pray that you would make it so. So Lord, let this be a continuance of our worship service now as we worship you in the preaching of your word. That it might be done well, that the scripture would not be abused, but treated preciously. And I pray that people would worship by how they listen, that they would cling to every word that comes from your scripture, that they would discern and and be Bereans regarding every word that is spoken that's not from your scripture, that they might test what is said against your holy word, and that you might bless us and make that unto yourself as worship. I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is the second uh, sermon from this particular verse, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. And we have been in 1 Peter since the beginning of the great coronavirus panic of 2020. The reason I chose this as our next sermon series to work our way verse by verse through 1 Peter is because this epistle was written by Peter the Apostle to a church that was in the midst of a time of chaos and struggle and panic. And believe it or not, their day and time, the panic in their era is, was even worse than the panic in ours. We have a relatively small thing happening right now, both in the panic and also the so-called cure to the panic that often seems worse than the disease itself. We have some struggles for sure, but they were literally being killed on account of their faith, and we're, we might get there one day, but we're not there yet, thankfully. And so I pray that this might be an encouragement to all of us, and I pray that it would encourage you. And if you're reading an ESV, you'll see at the top of this, it says, suffering for righteousness' sake. 
And that's their paraphrase, their summary of what's going to follow. But this is about how to suffer well. I want people to understand just because you're in the midst of suffering doesn't mean that you have to, well, you have to suffer in your suffering, if that makes sense. We can rejoice in our suffering. We can be encouraged amidst our suffering. We can even thrive in the midst of suffering. We can feast in the midst of suffering. We can have life in the middle of suffering, and that's the goal. And so in verse 8, he says, finally, all of you, and then he begins to list five different admonitions to the church, five different characteristics he wants them to have. And as I pointed out about three weeks ago, we know that uh, the Apostle Peter was a preacher because he uses that word finally in a metaphoric sense. He goes on for two chapters after he says finally. And when a preacher says finally, you know he's only about 60% done with the sermon. And so he says, finally, finally, all of you have unity of mind. And we discussed that uh, last week or the week before, whatever it was, that we as a church are to have a unity of mind. And I discussed the unity of mind uh, in the church on several different levels. There is the unity of mind that we are to have uh, with every believer in Jesus Christ with every person on the face of the planet who has been baptized into the church and who by a profession of their faith acknowledges that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died on the cross, that he rose again from the dead on behalf of our justification. And every believer who can testify that we are justified by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone is considered a brother in Christ and we ought to be unified with them on those essential matters. However, that unity should also go a step further and that is within our own congregation. As I pointed out at the time, we've had times in our church where we have been completely unified and we've had those times in our congregation where we have been divided. I would rather never again live through a period of time in which we are divided. Amen? Let's just avoid that if at all possible. But that requires focusing upon that which unifies us as believers. And then he gives us something in the next word that allows us to unify us even though we may have a difference of opinion on this thing or that thing. Let me read it to you again. Finally, all of you... Have unity of mind, sympathy, that's what we discussed last week, and then brotherly love. And this really is what unifies us as believers, the fact that we love one another. The reason why we love others is because God loves us. And there's no shortage of scriptures all throughout the scripture that tells us that we are to love one another. Now let me address something here that is often a misconception among, well, certain believers, particularly those who believe in the doctrine of election, as frankly every Christian should. The concept is, from some, if God can hate, then so can we. And it is a surprise to some Christians to learn that God does indeed hate sinners in his own judgment and in his own thought process, in his wisdom and out of the abundance of his character. The scripture says numerous times that God hates and God can hate that whichever he wants to hate and whoever he wants to hate. Psalm chapter 5 says God is angry with the wicked every day. But how, how many times have you heard the scripture? Six things the Lord hates. Yea, even seven. And one of those would be a lying tongue and a fa- or a false witness and hands that shed innocent blood. Or, of course, most famously, Romans 9. Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. I'm not saying God hates every sinner. I'm not saying God hates everything. I'm saying God has free will. And in God's free will, he can love that which he wants to love. And he can hate that which he wants to hate. And it's none of our business how God shows love or hate. None at all. That's his business. However, then some people make the leap 
of judgment, the leap of logic and say, well, therefore we can hate. And I have to say, I can't find that anywhere in the scripture. We are to love our neighbor as ourself. And Jesus told us that everyone qualifies as neighbor. God gets to hate certain things because he is the king of all creation. It belongs to him. He can hate it. Not us. We didn't make it. We don't get to hate it. We are to love every human being. We are to show them our love as much as humanly possible. But if you do a systematic theology of love in Scripture, you will find that more times than not, the admonition to Christians to love is specifically delegated to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not as though we don't love anyone else, but it's that the love that we have for the beloved of God, the church of God, ought to be magnified and, ex and extended. It ought to surpass the type of love that we have for those who do not belong to God's people. In other words, we ought to especially love our fellow brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Now, what is the connection between having brotherly love and enduring well in the midst of suffering and chaos? Well, that's a good question, and there are several different points here to be made. One of the reasons why a church that is in the middle of a culture that is contrary to the church, one of the reasons we should be filled with love one for another is because this may be the only place as the church gathers that a person ever feels loved throughout the week. There are people who do not feel loved at home. There are children who do not feel loved by their parents. There are spouses who do not feel loved by their spouses. There are certainly employees who do not feel loved by their employers. But when you gather among the people of God, you ought to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that these people love you. Now, how do you know that they love you? Well, it's interesting that the term that's used here is brotherly love. And I tell you what, when some people think of brotherly love, they think of close-knit affection, lots of hugging, doing things together, being bosom buddies, and those people are the ones who never had a brother. <laughs> when I think of brotherly love, I think of my relationship with my brother. We're not that close. Now, he's a Baptist pastor like I am. He's only two years older than me, and we could not be more opposite. I always refer to him as the nice one. And guess what? Everyone else refers to him as the nice one. That's not just me. I remember he would always beat me up when we would have wrestling matches, and we were told not to roughhouse, but my mother was a teacher, and she would go to work to teach summer school, and we were home, and we would lay down mattresses on the floor, turn on the WWF, and we would wrestle all day long. We would break stuff and possibly, I mean, I'm sure came close to breaking each other. One time, my brother was playing Karate Kid and shopped the window in the basement broke open. We like to roughhouse. And he always got the better of me because he's two years my senior. But guess what happened his senior year of high school? He lost about 70 pounds, and I didn't. That meant that I could suddenly throw him around like a rag doll. And boy, did I take advantage of throwing that skinny little twerp around. A couple things stand out in my mind. One is him running as fast as he could out, of the, out in the front yard. I grabbed the flagpole out of the ground and threw it at him. him and hit him in the back. He collapsed like a bag of flour. A few days after that, same thing. But the closest thing was a spatula. I threw it like an Indian would throw a tomahawk, hit him between the shoulder blades, and down he goes again. That typifies the type of brotherly love that I have with my brother. It's always been a sort of rivalry, and we haven't talked much at all. Uh, we just, we're not that close, but we know that if we ever need one another, we're there for one another. That's all there is to it. He was in his church office a few days ago. Someone knocked on the door. He thought something was amiss. 
he locked the door, wouldn't open it, took the license plate number. They looked suspicious, called the police, and sure enough, they were on the run in a stolen car. If you want to know how different my brother is than me, he doesn't own a gun. So I bought him one over the phone, and I texted him, brother, go pick up your gun at the closest pawn shop to where you live. And he says, thanks. No explanation. I don't need small talk. We don't have that type of relationship. But if you mess with my brother, I'm coming for you because he's my brother. And if he needs something, I'm going to be there for him. And if I need something, he's there for me. So brotherly love among Christians does not mean that we are holding hands or skipping through the tulips together. It means that we are, well, sometimes we may for sure have our differences. But when the chips are down, brothers are brothers. Now, when the scripture speaks of love, it is not the same type of love that a lot of us think about in our culture. And I have spoken about this till I'm blue in the face. Unless you're new to the congregation, you've heard me explain many times before that the Western notion of love, Greco-Roman romantic love, is not the same type of love that is spoken of in the Holy Bible. What we think about love in American culture comes from cartoons and romance novels of a demigod named Cupid who strikes someone in the rear end with a heart-shaped arrow. And the first person they see, they suddenly fall in love with. It is random, as Vodi Bakum would teach, it is a random, chaotic, sensual, overwhelming force. So it works like this. It's chaotic. The type of love that someone has for someone else in a romantic type of situation, it turns their life upside down. They begin to miss work. They can't keep their responsibilities. Everything is a mess because they're head over heels in love for another person. It is also sensual. They can't keep their hands off of one another. It's like a magnet where they're just drawn together and they can't help it. It's also perfectly random. In which people in this myth of love, this myth that we live under, they can't help who they fall in love with. How many times have you heard that? I can't help who I fall in love with. And so the soap operas demonstrate this random, chaotic, overwhelming, sensual type of love. A nurse runs across a doctor in a hospital they've never met before. They have an interaction, a cute, a meet cute type of moment. The next thing you know, they're making out in the janitor's closet and they're in love. It doesn't matter if they're both married. There's some kind of compelling force that just draws them together. And then love is something that you fall into. We say, I fell into love as though it is a trap on the ground that someone has planted. You just happen to accidentally stumble into it. What if I told you that that's a religious notion of love? It's religious. It wasn't invented by Hallmark. It was invented by Greco-Roman pagans in their religion revolving around a god named Eros and a demigod named Cupid. That's not how love works in the scripture. It is something that is thoughtful. It is a decision that is made. It is something that improves your life, not make it worse. It is something that turns you into a better person, that takes care of your needs, that requires selflessness, and sometimes a selflessness in which you deny your urges, not just give in to your urges. It is not something that you fall into. It is a decision that you make. That's what biblical love really is. Because if you have the Greco-Roman thought of love that 95% of our culture at least has, then when you fall in love, one day you're going to fall out of love. That's how divorces happen. I fell out of love. Well, maybe you shouldn't have fallen in love in the first place. Maybe you should have thought this out a little bit more. Maybe you could have put a little bit more forethought into it. They fall in love and then they fall out of love. Well, listen, if what you think love is, is a romantic feeling in your heart, you're going to lose that the first time you wake up post-honeymoon and your spouse speaks in your face and about knocks you over with morning breath. You will not feel the butterflies down in your stomach as you say, I'm so lucky. I'm so lucky to be with this person. I can't believe it. You're going to say, turn around, Why, brush, your, brush your teeth. I forget who I was talking to this week. I, I don't think it was any of you. 
and it's nothing that's secret, I assure you, but I was telling someone, and they were asking, what should I do in regard to my wife wants me to do this, but should I do that? And I said, do what your wife wants. I mean, it's, it, it wasn't a matter of right or wrong, but I said, do you understand what she does for you? She goes to bed with you every night. She has to, she has to go to bed seeing your face and wake up seeing your face. This is a woman who takes one for the team, all right? She sacrifices for you. So do the smallest thing and just appease her in this way. This isn't a matter of submission. Just do this thing. Like, understand what she gives for you on account of love. Now, what would happen if we applied this worldly Greco-Roman concept of love to our children? What would happen if your child is born and they are the eight pound, two ounce sw a swaddled b a baby and ball of joy? They smell like baby powder. They got that fresh baby smell. You know, it's like the new car smell. It's there for a while and then it kind of disappears. And no matter what, you can't bring it back. You got the new baby smell. There's nothing that can replace that. And then they turn two. And then what? you suddenly don't feel like that is the cutest little baby in the world. Swad, uh, cute, eight pound, two ounce swaddling ball uh, of joy. Uh, they're the ones that are sticking toys up their nose or in their ears. Or like my children do, put Legos in my boots. That's sadistic. I am pretty sure they do that on purpose. They become little poltergeists that move things around your house for no reason Pretty sure it's just to mess with you. They turn two or three, you're going to wake up one day and you're not going to feel as though you love your child. You're not going to feel as though you love your child. Here's the good news. Your feelings are altogether unimportant 99% of the time. Because the scripture says that our heart is deceitful and wicked and who can know it? I don't feel like I don't care what your feelings are. Back to empathy, the empathy sermon last week, that's where that comes into play. And you know how much this concept of Greco-Roman love and how feeling, feelings work, you know how much that has integrated itself into our thinking. When people share their opinions, they begin by saying, I feel like, hold on a second, I didn't ask what you felt, Casanova, I want to know what you think. We say feel instead of think because largely we're not a thinking culture. We're a feeling culture. But your heart is not equipped like your brain to make decisions. And your heart lies. So if it's not a Greco-Roman type of love that we are to have for our wife or for our children and certainly not for our friends in church, then what is a brotherly type of love? There's a couple characteristics of a brotherly type of love. Here's the first characteristic of brotherly love. And the word is phileo in Greek, or uh, it's actually philadelphos here, Philadelphia. It includes the brotherly part as a part of this love. This is the type of love that it is. Number one, brotherly love is not insecure. What that means is you don't have to worry about breaking up with your brother. Sometimes a friend gets mad at me, or usually not. Usually I'm just afraid they're mad at me. They say, hey, can we talk? I hate that. If, don't, please don't. If you love your pastor, don't say, can we talk? Because then I'm thinking, uh, okay, who did you kill? Who did I kill? Did I kill someone? Are you mad at me? What did I do? Are we breaking up? Uh, like, are you mad at me? Uh, tell me, if you would, if you love me, what you want to talk about so I don't worry about it. You know, with your wife, with your girlfriend, or with your spouse, with your friend at work, there is that question. Are we breaking up? And not necessarily romantically, but relationally. But with your brother, you don't ever have that conversation. You can't. Because they're your brother. And they're going to be there. Whether you want them to or not. They're part of you. And you're a part of them. You share something in common, which is your mom and your dad. I don't share much in common with my brother. But we share a mom and we share a dad. We share that. Here's the thing. You may not have much in common with the person sitting next to you in the pew. 
you may have very little in common with them. Different background, right? Different home life, certainly a different spouse, different kids, different job, different struggles. But, but, you have one thing in common. You share a father. You share a father. You got that in common. You know the king of kings, and he's your father. There's a certain connection that you have with a total stranger when you find out that you know the same people. And it's almost, you know, you're almost like excited, like you're in the airport, you're far away from home, somebody says, oh, uh, you're from Sydney, I know a guy who lives in Sydney, and then you know that guy. And you're, on the sudden, it's like, oh, all right, we know the same person. And, and you know, ultimately, what does that mean? Nothing, nothing. That doesn't mean anything. It's just, it's a small world, you know? There's no real connection, but you still, you still somehow feel connected. I get that way with theology nerds when they talk about they know such and such preacher, and he's an obscure preacher, but I really like this preacher. And I hear somebody say, they listen to that preacher. I'm like, really, you do? We're best friends now. Me and you, we're best friends because we listen to the same sermons every week, right? There's that connectedness. How much more should that connectedness abound when you know the one who died for me? And you know, I know, I know the one who died for you. And he's our God. And he's our God together. That's a connection that you have with fellow Christians. That is the bond of our love. So number one, the first type of love that makes it brotherly love is that it is, it is secure. It's not insecure. The second characteristic of brotherly love is that it is blunt. It is blunt. Because it is secure, you don't have to beat around the bush to say, you look fat in those jeans. You can just say, you look fat in those jeans. My mother panics whenever my brother and I are conversing. She's afraid that we're going to get into a fight that we will never be able to fix. We'll never have another Thanksgiving again. We're going to hate each other forever. And I'm thinking to myself, you have no idea the way we have talked to each other when you're not around growing up and we're still getting along. We have said some really terrible things, but it is blunt. Here's how that works in Christian love, barring the saying mean things to each other, and that is a Christian brother or sister in Christ should be able to approach you and say, listen, this is sin. This is a bad idea. This is wrong. And you not be offended as though it's some kind of stranger who approaches you who's getting into your business when they don't need to get into your business. When a fellow brother or sister in Christ does that, it's because they love you. And let me tell you a little secret. There are people on this earth who like to come to you personally and tell you where you're wrong. They are called sociopaths. I, I know a few people who really get their jollies from going to someone privately and saying, I think this is wrong of you. And it makes them feel better. There are a very small percent of people who will do that. And again, they're sociopaths. But when your brother or sister comes to you in private and says, I perceive this about your life, I perceive this about your situation, and I think that this thing that you're doing is either sinful or wrong or stupid or hurtful, I want you to understand that the vast majority of the time they are sick to their stomach when they do that. They do not look forward to it. It makes them sick. They're worried that you are going to hate them. They, you know, Paul asked the Galatians, he says, have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? And that's the legitimate fear that you face when you have to go to someone and say, what you're doing is not helpful. It's not conducive to living a happy life. This doesn't honor God. This can hurt you. That's why Christians need to do that regularly so that we know this isn't someone being a sociopath. This is actually just a Christian who loves you. This should happen far more often than what it does. For someone to say, you've got to knock this off. Quit that. I was told the last several weeks I've preached with my tie askew. 
Uh, one person said they couldn't listen to my sermon because they, it was bothering them so badly. But I noticed that a couple of ladies said something to me about it. Your tie is askew. I'm going to take that as love because I doubt you would do that to a random stranger. I refer to it as the zipper down conundrum. If I see someone in public and their zipper is down, I, if I know them, I'm not telling them. I feel bad for them, but I'm afraid that they're going to think I'm weird for noticing. <laughs> so I just let them live with it. But if I love them, I will stop and I will say, are you afraid of heights? You know, that whole thing, pull it up. It's because I love you that I'll say something about it. And Christians, there's a lot of us with our spiritual zipper downs, and we need people to say, you, you, you need to fix that. And it's not, out of, it's not out of hatred, it's out of love. How do you know that someone loves you? You know they love you when their love is not tied up in themselves, but tied up in something else. What I mean by that is, the way most people love, if you counseled, as I sometimes do, people who want to get married, you do premarital counseling, you'll ask the husband or the groom, the future groom, why do you love this woman? And they will often respond, well, look at her. She's beautiful, and she's smart, and she's kind. And my answer is always the same, I'm not going to marry you. What? Your reasons for loving her are bad. Because one day she's not going to be beautiful. She's going to be ugly. I mean, no offense, but we all get ugly if we live long enough. Just being blunt, it's going to happen. Sooner or later, somebody's going to see you, and you're going to look more like Yoda than you do a runway model because you're 90 years old. You're 100 years old. That's just going to happen. They're beautiful on the inside, but you know what I'm saying. Or... They may not always be smart. You know, sometimes people get a head injury and suddenly they're not so smart. That happens. But yet when you get married, you take a vow in sickness and in health. What are you going to do if you married your spouse because they're smart? They get a bump on the head in a car wreck and they're no longer smart. You going to leave their side? You going to be one of those people? I hope not. And sometimes they're not always kind. They go crazy sometimes. Sometimes it's just a bad day. Sometimes it's something chemical in the head. Sometimes they're hurting and in pain. The reason why you love someone has to transcend who they are and what they can do for you. It has to go beyond that, and it has to be tied up into the character of God. Turn to Romans 5. The reason why we love is because we have been loved. That's why. So sometimes uh, people are convinced that they get to determine how love is shown to them. There are a few possibilities of when that's correct. There are times where you do get to decide how people love you. For example, it's your anniversary and you like flowers and a specific kind of flower. You might just have the right to say, buy me some stargazer lilies or buy me some roses or buy me some tulips. You're the, you're the, the wife. I mean, it's your anniversary. You get what you want, right? But most of the time, you don't get to determine how people love you. What I mean by this is your children will sometimes use this as a manipulation tactic. And if your kids don't, my kids do, maybe they're the sociopaths, I don't know. But they will say, if you love me, you'll give this to me. Don't you love me? We had a kid one time say, if you love me, you'll give me this candy. No, because I love you, I'm not giving you that candy. What if they said, if you love me, you won't, you won't make me brush my teeth? Well, you should say, no, I'm forcing you to brush your teeth because I love you. I had a critic one time ask me that question, actually. He said, would you force your will? Oh, that's what it was. We were talking about God's will surpassing our will. So we have a free will. God has a free will. What happens when they contradict? Who wins? And the answer is God's will. 
God's will always wins over our will. He always gets his way in the end. And he said, would you force your will upon your children? And I said, yeah, I make them brush their teeth. And he said, you would force, you would actually force your children to, call, or to, to brush their teeth? I said, if you don't, you're a bad parent. He told me he was going to call the local CPS on me because I forced my children, I forced them to brush their teeth. He might have called. I never heard, but there are some weird people in the world. Love does not get to be determined by the object of love most of the time because often what people want is not at all what people need. Let me explain that to you. Here's how God shows his love. Verse 6 of Romans 5. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. How does God show his love? Rob Bell wrote a book several years ago against the reality of hell, a theologian who went south and one day he'll probably go really south, wrote the book, Love Wins. His point was, if God loves us, he would not send us to hell. God would show us his love by not letting us go to hell. But the scripture says God has shown his love by sending his son to die for sinners. You don't get to determine how God shows his love. God shows his love to save sinners by sending his son to die for them. His love for them is proven in his son's blood. I think that proves it. Now you know that whole thing from Galatians in which Paul says, Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? I have said this many times to to church family over the years, as I've had to confront them with this thing or that thing, and I ask them, have I not yet proven my love to you? Have I not been there for you? Have I not been there in rough times? Have I not prayed for you? Have I not gone out of my way to help you? Have I not tried to be your friend? And I'm going through that, not because I want to puff myself up, but I want them to understand, I love you. That's why I'm telling you this. But God can do that in the ultimate sense. He can say, I'm telling you these things because I love you. How do I know that you love me? My son bled for you. I sent my son to redeem sinners like you. I sent him to save people. And it says here, while yet they were ungodly. What that means is God did not send his son to die for God's children. God sent his son to die for God's enemies, to make them into his children. God loved us while we were yet still sinners. God loved us in our imperfections. And it's a good thing because we're still pretty imperfect. That means the type of love that we would therefore reflect to our fellow brothers and sisters in the church is the type of love that God has, which is not dependent upon how good of a person that is or what they can do for me. It's dependent upon the knowledge that God loved me even when I did not deserve to be loved. It's important for your children, your spouse, your friends to know that if I love you, it has nothing to do with what you can do for me, how good a person you are. It has everything to do with the fact that I know that I am very unlovable myself. And God the Father sent his son, Jesus Christ, in the world to redeem me. So that's why I choose to love you. That's the type of love that we are to have for one another that is absolutely independent of what we get out of that relationship or what we get from that person. Some of you parents know this the hard way because you've raised children who are ungrateful and they are adults and they are still ungrateful. And they are riotous and debauched. And yet, you love them as much now as the day they came out of the womb, right? This is the way that God loves his children. And this is the way that we love one another. And then finally, verse 10, he says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled 
to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. And more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliations. So as the church goes into tough times, as our culture out here changes, as it becomes more and more difficult, probably, in recent years to meet for worship, your, your biblical opinions, your Christian worldview becomes more and more outlawed in the workplace, in the school, in the public. All the more do we need to know there is a place where we can come, not a building, but among the people of God, the true temple of God, where we are loved no matter what praise god for that let's pray together father we thank you for the goodness that you've given to us in jesus christ and the goodness of a people with whom to worship and a savior who died for our sins and rose again from the dead we thank you for that in jesus name amen uh, pastor